just close it. So I just want, I just enjoy watching them play. So it's just high level of skill. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah, he is he is a high level precision partner, isn't he? That was not your spot. <laughs> and Randy was there, and then he left. Wow, oh, somebody's messing me up tonight. Um, Luke twenty-two. You go there in your Bible, Luke twenty-two. And before we uh, work our segment from that text, I was talking slow, stalling for you to get here. <laughs> and I'll have to be supervised when I teach class. So I'll bring you. <laughs> Let's pray again. What a privilege, Father, to be in your presence and gathered with uh, people who love you. And we pray tonight as we try to understand your Son that you will reveal him to us and that we would embrace his example in Jesus in Jesus name amen yeah. so I want to read, read a little segment for you in uh, in Luke 22 and uh, we've been, when I get done I'm just going to ask my standard question uh, what do you see and uh, try to give you another episode that gives us an angle on who Jesus was that we can spend some time exploring and using tonight. So we're, we're continuing to try to paint that picture. And so think about this little corner of the picture tonight. This is uh, Luke 22:39. Remember, I'm going to ask you what you see, okay? So y'all, y'all be ready to talk, right? Right? No, no, no awkward silence and blank stares when we get done. And he came out and proceeded as it was his custom to the Mount of Olives. And the disciples also followed him. And when he arrived at that place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw. And he knelt down and began to pray, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. Now an angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthening him. And being in agony, he was praying very fervently, and his sweat became like drops of blood falling down upon the ground. When he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping from sorrow and said to them, Why are you sleeping? Get up and pray that you may not enter into temptation. Okay, so there's... There's the little corner of the picture for tonight. Tell me what you see. Well, this wasn't the first time he went somewhere to pray, particularly here. This was something he did on a, evidently on a regular basis. So. Why do you say evidently? Do you mind if I follow up? Because he said, it, 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 as his custom, mm. as he would do, okay. it was his custom to, to go to the Mount of Olives. Gotcha, gotcha. Thank you. What else do you see? Uh, yes, I'm, I'm sorry. You were yeah, kind of you were you you kind of over my shoulder there. I miss you, Randy. Um, it, this verse always impressed me about the emotional strain Jesus was under about his upcoming crucifixion. Now, by by you know anybody who knew that this was coming your way would certainly be distraught. I don't know what a better word for it, but we rarely have a, a, an image like this of Jesus. He knew from the time he even left heaven before he came here that this this moment was coming, and yet we see here is a man who is struggling to deal with what he is going to have to face, and and to me that's kind of comforting because if you'd have just came in and said yeah I, yeah I, let's do it let's do it let's get this over with it would it wouldn't have meant as much I don't think to to mankind as the image of this means to us yeah this is the critical hour right how close are we. How close were we to crucifixion at this point? Less than a day. Hours. Yeah, no, this is hours. In fact, <coughs> you could argue that by this point, the people who will arrest him and kill him are on the way, right? Yeah. So, so 
it's one thing when you know something's scheduled out there, like have you ever had surgery? And the surgery was scheduled. Uh, having it scheduled is different from getting up that morning and being told you can't drink coffee and and knowing you're going to the place, right? And now they're going. This is it. It's happening. So it is the critical hour. Thank you. What else do you notice? Yes, sir. I think we got a critical warning in where he says, nevertheless, not my will, but your will. Oh, whatever the Father's will is. For, for us, it's, it's a critical thing. Because we yep. want to pray for things and waiting for God to deliver. But I don't think we're often enough willing to get into your will, not our will. Yeah, we're really good when he says yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Everything right. else, yeah. not so much. Not so much. David, it's, it's what else do you say? Yeah. It, it, it's interesting what Jesus asked his disciples to pray for, given how close he was to having to offer himself as a sacrifice and knowing what was what was fixing to transpire. Yet his request of them was to pray that, that they don't have Almost like he's anticipating they will yeah. enter into temptation. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. I think it's interesting. An angel from heaven strengthening him. He knew that angel. He had spent eternity with that angel. Oh, I never thought about that before. Yeah. It makes me curious who it was. Not that it matters, but Jesus, if he was special to Jesus in some way. So are you like me and you're always getting frustrated because you have these curiosities? Tell the whole story. <laughs> tell, story. Tell the whole story. I want to run that angle some more. <laughs> Thank you. What else do you see? Who else wants to get in? One other, one other point. Um, it's Jesus' request to the Father about if there's any way that this can be done another way, yeah, let's do that. Because that's interesting because on two fronts, I think, from my perspective. One is, he was exploring the option, is there another way to do this? Okay. Um, on the other hand, he knew exactly what his crucifixion and the, spritz and the spilling of his blood meant to mankind. And so, you can see the real struggle, I think, in his own mind, like, Father, can we figure out some other way to do this? Because I really, really don't want to go through what is about to happen while at the same time recognizing that it took his blood the perfect sacrifice it had to happen, it had to happen. it's just interesting his going back and forth and, and considering is there another way yeah. i think that's right thank you i think we uh i think it's interesting because you know we're told or we're taught not to be afraid of death i mean it's not death but jesus knew he was there he came to earth and he was going back and he was still scared to die. He was still afraid. He was in torment. I'm not sure if he's afraid of death. He was, he was afraid of the way he was. I, Either way, he's afraid so. of the way it's going to happen. I, I don't think he's happy about about the process. How this is going to move from one to the other. Yes, ma'am. And not only that, but you know, you really cannot imagine what pain is totally until you're going through it. Yeah. And even true. though he was tormented, he still, he knew it was going to hurt, but you can't imagine the pain. I, I, I want y'all to consider the action in this segment we just read. What are they doing? They're sleeping. But they're supposed to be. Right. And what's Jesus doing? Right. Did you notice that there are five verses and also five references to prayer? Right? So, one of the things that I noticed when I read this segment is this is one of many examples of the Gospels where we find Jesus on his knees. Can you think of other examples? The temptation. <clears throat> Sorry? He was in the temptation when the devil tempted him right after he was baptized. Okay. Think of other places where it says Jesus prayed. When he retreated to the mountains after being surrounded by the crowd and wanted to be alone. There is an episode, at least one, where he retreats to the mountain. Actually, probably more than one to go and pray. Thank you. Think of other places where he prayed. 
He prayed over the meal before they ate the loaves and fishes. At the, the, the Lord's Supper, there's prayer offered there. Think of other places. Lessons. Sorry? Before lessons. Lazarus. 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 Oh, we called out to the Father for Lazarus. Yes. Thank you. Any other places? Are there other places? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Want to look at some? Can I take you through some real quick? Mark 1. Back up a little bit. I'll mention some that y'all haven't mentioned. Mark 1. Verse 35. <coughs> To really appreciate this one, you have to remember that verse 32 says, When evening came, after the sun had set, they began bringing to him all who were ill. So as night fell, the crowds are coming. 35 says, In the early morning, while it was still dark. So all of this activity is between sunset and sunrise. Jesus got up, left the house, went to a secluded place, and was there praying. Jump ahead to, to Luke 5. Luke 5. Go down to verse 15. But the news about him was spreading even further, and large crowds were gathering to hear him, and to be healed of their sicknesses, but Jesus himself would often slip away to the wilderness and pray. And Troy, that's why I asked you earlier when you said this was his custom. I wanted to know where you were going with that, because I think when you read the Gospels, which are typically very, very concise, if you think about that, guys, we know virtually nothing about the life of Jesus. Have you ever pondered that? We have these episodes scattered across three years. We have little snippets of his teaching. But the great bulk of what happened, we have no record of. Just these very select pieces that the Holy Spirit knits together into the story God wanted us to have. And part of that story is the Spirit's focus on the fact that again and again and again Jesus prayed. And not just the remarkable moments like right here in the shadow of the cross of Luke 22. Mark tells us yeah, he got up one morning after an eight, late night and went out and prayed. So in this extraordinarily concise book one of the pictures I think the Spirit is determined that we see is this picture of Jesus. God on his knees. Question, is it interesting that Jesus spent all this time praying? Have you ever thought about that? Why is Jesus spending all this time praying? He's communicating with the Father. I'm sorry? He's communicating with his Father. And, and there's lots of things for him to be considering and decisions to be made. How he treats situations. How does he, how does he uh, deal with this set of people or this person? You know, what's the best way? I think that he's seeking, <clears throat> although he is God manifest in the flesh, he's a human as, as we are. So he's looking for God's direction, God's favor in what he does. That's what I believe anyway. And then we also know that God has told us, he's revealed unto us all we need to know. So all these, all these different things we're seeing of Jesus... <clears throat> are critical for us to know because he wants us to know them. Yeah, it's the picture he wants us to see. It's the picture he wants us to see. Yeah, yeah, us to yeah, see. yeah I, I buy think that. he wants to communicate with his father. It's interesting you say that because uh, I want you to think for a minute about our prayers. <clears throat> Typically, when we're not more careful about content, what are we typically bringing to God when we pray? Think about that. Stuff we need. Okay. Now, now, I agree with that, and we all know we ought to do more than that, but I think typically we come to God because we need stuff. But I think the stuff we need also falls into a special category. We need a relationship with Him. Yeah, hold that thought. I'm coming back. Okay, put that up on the shelf. Thank you. Thank you. That is the point. Yeah. But what kind of stuff do we need God to do for us? You ever thought about this? 
and I lost you. Didn't we, no, 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 but we no. need we need him to help us be an example. We need him to help us to not sin. We need him to help us to be what he wants. Us okay, to okay be. you're warming up to it. I think typically what we bring to God is stuff we need help with, right? Stuff I cannot do on my own. So my grandchild is sick and is in the hospital, and I am not a doctor. And man, I really, I really want God to do something about that. I really am going to lift this up to Him. In fact, I think our most passionate prayers are things we need Him to do that we cannot do. Right? You with me on that? Where did I see a hand? There was a hand up. Someone, someone hey. was waving that way. So I go back to James, where it says, "Draw near to God, and He'll draw near to you." And we also know that if we flee. If you resist the devil, he will flee from us. I mean, by how do we draw nearer to God? By entrenching ourselves in God's word, but having that relationship where we pray to Him, where we talk to God. Okay, you're getting ahead of me. Hold that thought. Same, same, same thing. Y'all hang on to that. I promise, I'm getting there. You guys are, you guys are just a step ahead of me. Okay. Uh, but, but I want you to think about how we typically pray. You get to, it's to get God to do stuff for us that we can't do for ourselves. So, is that why Jesus is praying? No. You see my point? Jesus is God. He, he doesn't need the Father to intervene and do stuff for him that he can't do for himself. I think that I think you guys warmed it up a minute ago. I think you were on track. I think primarily Jesus prays to the Father because he desires a relationship with the Father. And so they're communicating like people do in a relationship with each other. He desired communion and communication. I would suggest sometimes I think we treat God like a vending machine. So I was telling the kids about this Wednesday night, and I said said the same thing. We treat God like a vending machine. I said, you know, you stick a quarter in and get what you want. And then they said, yeah, I wasn't a quarter for a long time, right? You stick in a dollar or a couple of bucks in the vending machine. Tells you how much I use vending machines. I think they take credit cards now too. But that's, that's what prayer is. Prayer is the, the the dollar. It's the it's the card I slide in there to to what? Get what I need to get there. what I want from them. That's exactly right. And I think, I, look, are we supposed to pray for things that we want and need? Yes. Yes. God tells us to do that. But I don't know. I don't think prayer is primarily about getting God. To do stuff for me. I think at the core it is about a relationship with Creator. So I remind you, y'all heard Randy say this, surely, that, um, that what has God wanted all along but a people who would choose to be His people. And a piece of that relationship is communication, a vital piece of it. And I think we miss that about prayer. I think we too much connect prayer with God like a vending machine. I need to get stuff. And I think that Jesus shows us what is really the fundamental critical part of prayer. And that is, it's about a relationship and about communicating in that relationship. See, you were the one that had your hand up a minute ago that I was trying to get to. Go ahead. You've been, you've been very patient back there on the back row. We typically pray for, I would call it earthly needs. Things that affect us here on earth and not the spiritual needs. I think that's true. Thank you. Had several other hands. You've been waiting. Coming to you next. I thought some about this, and I'm wondering if, when Jesus took on the form of man, the communication that he had with the Father and the Holy Spirit had to change. He, he wasn't part of the three when he was here. He, yes, he was part of the three, but he was separated from the three. And so I think the demonstration that Jesus is showing us is that communication at a different level. He was separated from the Father, so this was the only means that he could use. When he was in heaven with the Father, there was much, probably much more communication and relationship was there, but now he's finding himself down on this planet by himself, and he's giving us an example of what that relationship looks like from a man's point of view. Certainly, as God in a human body, he is showing us that connection in the way that humans do. Yes, yes sir. Yeah, you were talking about the communication of Jesus to God, right? Even just his posture, falling to your knees, it's a very submissive form of communication. If I'm on my knees, I'm very vulnerable to anyone around me. And it's specifically anyone that I'm conversing with. It's a very vulnerable position. And I think that's where Jesus is not only showing in his voice, but in his body language, I'm submissive to what we're about to do. 
Yeah, and, and, and the moment, wrap the moment into that. What's happening in this moment? Yeah. It's the difficult hour. And, and I think you see the human, the human part coming out in all of that. So, so I really wanted to spend some time first getting you to see this picture and then thinking about how extraordinary, extraordinary it is that the Creator not only is seeking us to have a relationship, but eagerly desires that His people talk to Him. I, I think we are just, just, just way too um, trivial in the extraordinary blessing to know that we can call out to God and that He wants that. Most of us, please don't make this political, most of us would just faint if we got a call like from our senator or what if the president called you up this morning and said, I just want to know what you guys think about this. Would you would you chat with me about this? I mean, y'all would be like putting that on Facebook, right? And here God's in heaven saying, and I'm the one running the show, and I want you to talk to me. Right? So here's the odd thing about that. And I want to I want to walk down this path just a little bit. Um, so many disciples, it seems to me, do not see that prayer at all as this extraordinary privilege. Do y'all think that's right? Do y'all buy that? I remember back in Beaumont, we did this thing at the end of the year where we asked the church as we were planning for the next year to share with us what you were struggling with spiritually. And so we did that one year, and I mean, number one item on the list, the people in our church family said, we really struggled to pray. Now, isn't that interesting? That the Creator is saying, talk to me. And our folks were saying, yeah, we really struggle to do that. And so, man, we spent a whole year focused on prayer. We had, like, gospel meetings on prayer. We had classes on prayer. We preached about prayer. For a whole year, we worked on it. And then, at the end of that year, we surveyed the church again. And we asked, what are you struggling spiritually? How can we help you next year? Guess what was number one on the list? <laughs> what? So, maybe we just did a poor job addressing that need. But I get the sense talking to people that lots of disciples struggle with this. Do y'all think that's true? I do. And I'll tell you, I think it's so easy to talk to somebody that's sitting right in front of you and you're getting back what you're giving. You're talking and you're, you're communicating with each, with each other. Um, but when you're talking to God, you're more like just talking to thin air. And you know who you're talking to, but it just, it's it, you're not getting back what you would get back from a person sitting in front of you. The kids said that across the hall Wednesday. That, that was one of the differences. If I'm talking to Troy, I could see him and I could hear him when he speaks and I can watch his face and know if I made him mad or happy or whatever or if he's bored and you don't have that when you talk to God. Well, and, and Troy is going to immediately respond to you. Yeah, yeah. I think we tend to get, sometimes, <laughs> Troy is It depends on whether or not it makes you mad. completely unbothered. Um, no, but, I, and when we, I, and we know that God hears us and He answers us, but it's not always in a way that we understand. Sometimes it's in a way we don't want to understand because we don't like his answer, we don't like his response. It's not what we expect. Or it's slower. It's slow. It's not instant. From it, it's yeah. not, and, and we, so it can, I mean, of course I only speak for myself. Like, it feels like a one-sided conversation occasionally. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm spilling all of this out. Like, mm -hmm. and. I agree. I, I, here I, I, we are. That becomes difficult. I do, think, I do think that is a valid point, but I want to challenge you to ponder this. Is it a faith point? Is it is it something that's saying to me, and I'm not indicting any of you, I'm just talking about me. Is it something <coughs> saying to me that maybe I need to get underneath that struggle and say, do I really believe? Yes. Because I think so many of our struggles have really, really deep roots, and they're challenging the fundamentals. Probably none of us in our lifetime are going to have someone put a gun to our head and say, deny your faith or die. Right? But do I really believe it? That I would be willing to do. Right? 
So I wonder if things like this sometimes aren't an evidence to, or at least suggesting maybe, maybe that fundamental faith piece needs to be stronger. I don't know. I just wonder about things like that. But I do think it's interesting that, that Christians struggle with this so much. One of the problems I think is right is I can't see him. And I don't get that instant reaction and feedback. Yes, ma'am. I think if we couple prayer with being in his word and we're going to hear him speak to us. I mean, sometimes that's hard because our things are so physical. Right. But he addresses everything somewhere in his word. Okay, can I wrap into that too? That I think sometimes an element of the problem is our lack of patience. Because, because sometimes when you've prayed to Him and then you spend time in His Word, there's this gap between my prayer and my seeing, right? And my understanding what He sees as yeah. best for me. Yeah, and we don't do much waiting in this culture. Have y'all ever thought about that? Are y'all with me on that? Mm -hmm. We don't do much waiting. Be honest. You have yelled at the microwave, right? Uh, you have yelled at, come on! I don't know about 30 more seconds, right? Or you've yelled at a traffic light. Oh my Or when you call somebody, push one for this or two for that. There, there, there are, yeah, yeah. We are not accustomed to have to wait. And an innate part of this praying thing, because sometimes it means I'm, pray, I'm asking for wisdom, and the way I'm going to get it is I'm going to hear his voice and let him speak to me. And maybe that, ta maybe that takes a year of Bible study or reading. I think patience is a part of that too. Yes, ma'am. No, I just gonna say is, uh, you. Uh, I can trust in you <coughs> as long as I know you. The more I know you, I can trust in you. Yeah. The same thing. That's what happened to God. We don't know God. We don't trust Him. So that our faith depends on how much do we know God. And that's what happened to the Israelites all the time because they, they, they fell believing that God was gonna deliver them. But look what He did. All the templates and all the miracles. But it's just like the more we know Him. The stronger our faith will be. The heart says, be still and know that I am God. Yeah. How still can we be? Yeah. I mean, truly, I that's right. how still are we? Yeah. I think that's right. So, so what I want y'all to appreciate with me is how bizarre it is. <clears throat> because it really is that God's saying, I want to hear from you. I want that kind of relationship. And we're saying, yeah, it's really hard to do that. It's really hard to do that. And let me tell you one other piece at, at the risk of opening a can of worms. I, I, I think I think one other piece of this too is that we don't need very much. Come on. We don't need very much. I mean, we say we do, but none of you are wondering if there will be food to eat tomorrow. But there are people on the streets of Mumbai right now that that's all they care about. Where will I find something to feed my grandchild tomorrow? That's their life. And so I think that's another piece of the problem. We don't really need very much. And what we do need, to be honest, it's, it's, it's top water stuff. It's true. In the big picture. Uh, go to Luke 11 now. And so let's tie this together with what we're working on in this class. There's this, this other scene I want to wrap in to this picture we're painting of God on his knees. <laughs> Watch this. This is Luke 11, 1. It happened that while Jesus was praying in a certain place, after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John also taught his disciples. And then he goes on to talk to them about prayer. So I'm really intrigued by this. Evidently, um, another place like Troy was talking about earlier where, where, where evidently the Lord has been doing this so much that these people close to him, who are with him all the time, are saying, wow, he just prays all the time. And their impulse is to say, help me with that. Help me do that too. And so one of the things that this nudges me to ponder is as I'm reading and seeing in Scripture this picture I wonder, okay, so what can I learn from it? Clearly that's why it's there. I'm supposed to learn something from this habit. Maybe things that would help me along the way. So, so I left us about 20 minutes because I thought we could probably work on this a while. 
and I'll give you the first shot at it. My question is going to be, would you see in the Bible's painting of Jesus these frequent references to prayer? What do you learn from it? What does he teach you about prayer? Be as practical as you want to be with that. I'd like to hear what you think about it. Be that. secluded. Seclusion, yeah. Tell me who, 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 who we both did, but I mean, also seclusion. Tell me what you're. Tell me what you mean when you say that. We need time for solitude with God, away from the turmoil, away from the noise, away from the world. Yeah. Be to go in a closet. Yeah, yeah. But also, I was saying, I, I said. Uh, what did submission. I say? Submission. Thank you. That's what oh, I said. I said submission. Oh, yes. Yeah. So I want y'all to to think about that, and I'm I'm gonna hijack y'all's answer, okay? But y'all been in class with me enough to know there's nothing new about that. I I think there are two fundamentals that you gotta have to pray in a meaningful way. Solitude is one of them. Got any idea what my second's going to be? I'm going to add to that. I would say the channel's always got to be open. Okay, I'm not sure what that means. So, I can't think how to put so, that in one word. Yeah. I guess what I'm trying to say is, is that the Bible talks about praying without ceasing, right? And okay. so, so I've got to have a frame of mind where I can talk it to Jesus in a moment when something is happening in my life where I need his help, his wisdom, his his counsel, his whatever you All right. put that in. But, We're going to come back and get that. But, Let me ask you to pause. Okay. Hold that thought. Because I want to I want to work that whole as a completely idea. A okay. different idea, okay? Uh, the other thing I wanted to put up here with solitude is time. Right. That's that's what I was thinking about. It's a very practical matter. If you're going to communicate God with God in a meaningful way, I've got to pause to do that. And I need some things to make that happen. For example, I do not need solitude to watch a movie, and it drives my wife insane. In fact, when I'm watching a movie, my iPad is open, and I'm checking the news, I'm looking at social media, and I'm texting people, and clearly I'm not the only couple that has a problem with that in the back, because Matt and Susan are, are giving each other that couple look. So, so do you also ask Heidi, now what did they say? <laughs> Why are they there? <laughs> no. no, because because I don't need to. I get as much of the movie as I want while doing all the other stuff. You can't do that. Can't. In, fact, in fact, if you want to prove that, guys, try talking to your <coughs> wife. Have an important conversation with your wife while you are texting someone else about golf on Saturday. And let me know how that works out for you. Let me, let me know how that works, right? We need... We need this. We need this quietness. Now, now, Jesus prayed a lot because he had all of that. That was not a problem for him. He had to go off by himself. He still he had, had to go, go off by himself. He purposely found time to take. To go yeah, let's identify his distractions. Can you make me a list? <laughs> people. people, people. Okay, really two people is. People. I can't give you people. That's too. That's too general. I need okay, specific. The disciples, what people? The disciples, the crowds. Okay, there are crowds, and as the ministry moves forward, what happens with the crowd problem? Okay. It gets worse because the crowds get bigger. They find out he's a miracle worker, a healer, and frankly, if you have cancer, where are you going? Jesus is in the next town. We are going so we can go get healed, right? So I'm not saying that was a great motive. I'm just saying it was a motive. So there are the crowds, and that problem, as we get closer to the end, gets bigger and bigger and bigger. What other people does he have to deal with? Disciples. Sorry? The disciples. disciples. How often are the 12 with him? All the time. 24-7. At least they're good, mature guys that don't cause him much stress. Why are y'all laughing? They uh, <laughs> like Yeah, they did. All the time. They acted like tall. Oh, I'm going to be more important than the kingdom of you. And Jesus is like, did you hear the sermon this afternoon? Come on, man. Uh, always, they're always with him. They're always pestering with questions as well. And so even when he can pull back from the crowds, he has this entourage that is there all the time. Okay, so we have a people obstacle. What other obstacles were there for him? Sorry? People wanted to kill him. We didn't add that group to Yes, he is always having to be careful, especially toward the end, 
to think about where he's going to avoid people who were a danger to him. Thank you. We could add to the enemies to the list. I think he also has to manage his time because he kind of knows the time's coming. So he's got probably certain things in his agenda he wants to get accomplished. Okay. Is Jesus working with a deadline? Yes. And how often do you think he looked at Peter and said, Father, we need more time. Peter's not ready. <laughs> right? Yeah. So yeah, I mean he's he's got to get these guys ready because he's 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 going, and so uh, his work has a definite end to it. What other obstacles do you see? Yeah, yeah, he had to deal with their distraction. How about physical exhaustion? I was gonna say he doesn't have a place to call his own. He does not have a home or a room where. It's comfortable and it's the way he likes it. Or you get the sense I spent a lot of time camping, yeah. which is why I would not have been chosen as one of the twelve. <laughs> <laughs> would not have been one of those guys. The other thing was just doing the religion of the day. I mean, look how many times he was in the temple. Going down the he was doing this. And, I mean, he was trying to do the religious things and maintain his presence in that in that setting. So to find food, he didn't have food readily available yeah. everywhere he went. I mean, had to go do had things to like get that. Food exactly every day. Right. The daily operation of life was still there as well. So so one of the things that I want you to notice about Jesus is he makes time. He doesn't take time. There's a difference, right? He makes time. He takes in the midst of all these business busyness and he carves out these moments of time so that he can communicate with his father. Now talk to me about how he does this because interestingly the Holy Spirit thought it was important for us to literally know the details of how Jesus does this. Snuck away. He, he snuck away. I mean sometimes he said I need time to go. Like I'm going to go. Yes. So, so one so of the things... Like, he would sneak away but he would also just like be forthcoming with the people around him like crowd I, need, control. I, I need to go <coughs> yeah crowd Wait control yeah. Oh, this is yeah. he sends yeah. away the crowd sometimes I think sometimes that's Matthew 14 night, what's that? sometimes it's in the middle of the night he yeah. The time in the middle yeah. Of the night. He'll, he'll send the crowd away send the disciples ahead of him and then he's up on a mountain right what are the, why do you guys think he keeps picking a mountain seclusion, seclusion. He's, he's battling for solitude. i got to get away from where the people are. And so timing was a factor. That text in Mark, I think, is so, so impressive. When you just kind of pause and take in the details of how Jesus, long, long night, and he's up in the morning before dark, and the disciples get up and he's gone. And they have to go looking for him. Right? You see the point? So... One of the things I think to learn from Jesus is one, I need these two things, right? I need these two things. But I have to make them happen. I know you're thinking, I've got two little kids at home, right? How do I find these two things? Can I argue that the other way? If you've got two little souls, that are almost completely controlled by your influence right now? How do you have time not to pray at a moment? I gotta be praying when my kids are at home and they're growing up. I'm busy at work. I got all this stuff that I'm gonna do. Yeah, Jesus was saving humanity from their sins. He was pretty busy, got a lot of stuff to do. Let's be honest with ourselves. It's not about my time. It's about my choice of what is important to me. We make the times, we make the time for the thing that matters to us, right? Y'all believe that? We make the time for the ten things that matter to us. And so this is this is a have to. I gotta make the time. Carve out the solitude to go and do that. I don't know what works for you. You got two little kids at home, maybe that's husband coming in, or husband and wife taking terms, say, I need some private time, I'll go for a walk in the park. Okay? I don't know about you guys. I don't know what y'all do about position and all that kind of stuff. I cannot pray in a stationary position. 
like go sit in a chair, can't do that. It does not work for me, okay? I am, I am really distracted when I pray. I like think about something when I'm praying and I think, oh man, but okay, hold on, God, I need to call a text. I need to text them. Okay? I do that. It's just how I have. It's terrible. So if you are ever at the church building and you notice someone moving in the auditorium even though the lights aren't on, and you know what I'm doing? I'm praying. Don't come in. You take my solitude away. I go and I just walk because that's the way it works for me. you got to find something that works for you, a place that works for you where you can get off where it's quiet. All right. Let's talk a little bit about pray without ceasing. Where does that come from? First Thessalonians 5.17. Pray without ceasing. Boy, has that caused our brethren some angst over the years. How in the world do you do that? Pray without ceasing. <clears throat> we don't think that means. Yes, ma'am. Well, even when you um, something happens and you're not necessarily planning on saying a prayer, saying thank you, God, is a prayer. You know, thank you for it. It's hard not getting you or whatever. Yeah. yeah. I, I want you to notice, I, I think we are meant to get the impression that Jesus is prayed all the time. I think that's why there are so many references. And then, the Spirit inspires Paul to say, pray without ceasing. So what do you think he's saying to us? What do you think he's telling us to do when the Spirit says... Don't stop praying. He's trying to get us to know the three words before that. Which are? Be joyful always. <laughs> yeah, we, we treat it like it's a burden. But, I mean, that's be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks. I mean, wow. Be joyful always. We can talk to God. Be joyful. And then keep talking to Him. Yeah, I think if we had a better sense that we're talking to him and he hears and compassionately and is one eager to respond, I think that gets easier. Uh, let me ask you this. Do any of you have a really good friend that pretty much every day, all day, there's kind of a running text conversation with him? I mean, you just leave it up. Even if y'all take a break, hey, hey, I gotta go. I gotta go in and, uh, and talk to the kids' uh, teacher at school, and uh, and so there's a pause. And then later that afternoon, it's like, hey, turkeys aren't selling HEV. Do you have anybody like that? That there's just kind of this running, off and on, conversation. That to me is sort of what praying <coughs> without ceasing is. It doesn't mean I'm just every single moment praying. I don't, you don't even know how you would do that. But I do I think it's having that sense of I'm in his presence, he hears my voice, he's here, here for me. And so I just have a running conversation with him all the time. My mind is inclined toward him. I'm sensitive to his presence and I want to engage him. It's sort of like we are with a friend. Those of you who have grown children, when you find out you're going to have a grandbaby, what do you do? Don't tell anybody. Man, did your kids do that to you? We're going to have a baby, but don't tell anyone. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. I ain't doing that, right? No, you want to share that good news, right? You want to tell anybody about that, right? Yes, ma'am. So I'm thinking of two things. I'm thinking of his parable of the widow and the solicitor. How she just repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly came back, came back, came back. We don't just ask God once and then like, okay, he knows, you know, and then, um, oh, I lost the other thing. But I think I wonder if that's another thing of like, you know, don't just say, do, don't just do one and done. You know, we're repeatedly coming back. And the other thing I guess I think I'm thinking of is I think there's periods of our lives where we go through, we're angry at God and we don't, we don't want to have that open relationship. But we still need to be working on it, even if maybe even if our heart's not in it. Oh, wow, that's such a can of worms. I want so much to mess around with some of that <laughs> stuff because I, I think that, that the part you said where sometimes we're angry with God that like freaks out a lot of Christians. 
Um, read the Psalms, okay? The psalmist was angry with God sometimes, and it's quite plain about how he feels about that. Uh, and that certainly would, I think, I think that would end in our prayer life as well. Um, oh, I remember the other thing. Jesus didn't pray once in the garden. Yeah, he again prayed, and again and again. It's at least told us three times in the garden about the same thing. Okay. Sorry. No, no, that's okay. Let me ask you a question. Do you ever talk to your friends about the same thing? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like those of you with teenage children. Mm-hmm. When I had teenagers at home, I used to get together with other people that had teenagers so that we could trash our children together. It was so <laughs> reaffirming. Are you dealing with this here, Ross? Is your kid doing that? Oh, thank you. At least I know life's normal, right? Uh, there, there, was, there, was, there was this uh, a sense of comfort in getting together and sharing the struggle, right? We, we, we talk to our friends sometimes about the same thing over and over and over again. Um, I, Luke 6.12. Do you all remember this text? Look at Luke 6.12. And let me wrap this into the mix. Because this passage has always bothered me a lot. Luke 6.12. And it was at this time that he went off to the mountain to pray, and he spent the whole night in prayer to God. Does that bother you, what Jesus does here? Because spending 12, 8 to 12 hours in prayer in the middle of the night and not falling asleep and keeping focus and keeping... What are you saying? Yeah. That was, it, it, it didn't just bother me that, that I have not prayed all night. I began to ponder, oh man, I would like you to make a list. What would you say for 8 hours? Through the night, talking about. I'm sure there was some repeating going on. He did Jesus, I mean, more stuff was probably more important to him than others to talk to God about. So he's over and over and over. Well, let me tell, let me tell you what I have done though, and I bet y'all done this too. I have sat in my office for an entire afternoon talking to Jeff. Some issue had come up, maybe something going on in the church. Or something going on with his family, or my family, or some concern among brethren. And I guarantee you, we sat there, and we took that issue, and we destroyed it. I mean, just talked it to death for hours and hours. I know you're surprised here, Jeff can talk that long. But um, <laughs> but he can, right? You've talked to a friend for hours and hours and hours when your heart was heavy, or, or there was a big decision, right? You've had that conversation. I mean, we've done other activities for extraordinary amounts of yeah. time mm-hmm. without thinking twice about it. By the way, what's happening next year, Luke 6? He's choosing the apostles. Yeah. The apostles are going to be chosen, right? Father, we need to talk about this. We have a conversation about this. But maybe also, <clears throat> there's an element, you know, you know the elements of prayer, like you spend time praising God and telling God how amazing He is and remembering what He has done. And so you spend time doing that and then you spend time asking for forgiveness and you spend time, you know, like all these lists of people. So it's not just one thing, no? Yeah, I, I think that, I guess what I'm trying to drive to in the class is I feel that sometimes we have treated prayer as a spiritual obligation rather than a relationship privilege. And what I hope I can challenge you to see in the example of Jesus is how this is a piece of a relationship and the kind of relationship that he wants to have with us. I think too often we kind of teach you treat Jesus like a fire extinguisher. You got a fire extinguisher at your house? Did you use it last week? Do you know where it is? Right? It's only in the emergency. Bottom right on the pantry. We've had it there four years. We've never used the fire extinguisher. Why? I had a fire. I needed it. And see, I think that's I think that's how we treat our relationship with Jesus. When I have an urgent emergency, I'm going to go grab him. That's when I need him. And what I think Jesus is trying to teach us is I don't want to be your fire extinguisher. I want to be your friend. And I want to have that kind of relationship. And critical to that is regular, constant, chronic 
communication back and forth. Are there some hurdles with that? Yeah. I can't see him. So I'm going to strengthen my faith to know that he's there and that he hears. And if I can go back to what you said earlier, I want to tag this too. Remember, it isn't a one-side conversation, right? Because the other piece of it is, I need to let him talk. And we do that how? I got to be back in the book. I got to hear So ponder that picture of Jesus in your own prayer. Start that in your mind as you see if he can help you learn how to pray. Thanks for your help tonight.
those who need to, the Lord's Supper will be served in room 12 when we finish up in here tonight. First song is To the Lamb. I think this is uh, still a relatively new song, so help me out and, uh, and sing out on this one. I, I, th- I thought the message of both of these songs were good takeaways uh, from the time we've spent in the Word today. Watch the message and see if you see that too. We are to the sing we will glorify the king of kings if you would please be standing for this song after the song we'll have our closing prayer go to God in prayer. Our Almighty Father in heaven, we are so thankful for this time that we have shared here this day for the opportunity to gather together to center our thoughts on Christ and his sacrifice, to open your word, to study and learn from it, to worship you, to encourage and stir up one another in love and good works. It has been such a blessing for us to be together today, and we pray that we, our faith has been strengthened by this. And Father, as we leave and enter into this week, we pray for the wisdom that we need to conduct ourselves in a manner in which we may walk according to the Spirit and not in the desires of our own flesh. Pray that we might stand firm and committed to you, obedient to your will. Help us to be the light in this world, sharing the gospel and being the example that you desire of us. And May our actions honor and glorify you this very week. Father, we thank you so much for your love, and we give you thanks for the salvation that you offer us. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Thank you for participating in today's worship service presented by the Kleinwood Congregation of the Church of Christ. You can listen again to today's service on our website, 
Klein 